Lesson 12 Covenant Faith Sabbath Afternoon June 12 It was taught by the Jews that before God's love is extended to the sinner, he must first repent. In their view, repentance is a work by which men earn the favor of heaven. And it was this thought that led the Pharisees to exclaim in astonishment and anger, This man receiveth sinners. According to their ideas, he should permit none to approach him but those who had repented. But in the parable of the lost sheep, Christ teaches that salvation does not come through our seeking after God, but through God seeking after us. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. Romans chapter 3 verses 11 and 12. We do not repent in order that God may love us, but he reveals to us his love in order that we may repent. When the straying sheep is at last brought home, the shepherd's gratitude finds expression in melodious songs of rejoicing. He calls upon his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. So when a wanderer is found by the great shepherd of the sheep, heaven and earth unite in thanksgiving and rejoicing. Christ's Object Lessons, page 189 As the penitent sinner, contrite before God, discerns Christ's atonement in his behalf and accepts this atonement as his only hope in this life and the future life, his sins are pardoned. This is justification by faith. The sinner may err, but he is not cast off without mercy. His only hope, however, is repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Father's prerogative to forgive our transgressions and sins because Christ has taken upon himself our guilt and reprieved us, imputing to us his own righteousness. His sacrifice satisfies fully the demands of justice. Justification is the opposite of condemnation. God's boundless mercy is exercised toward those who are wholly undeserving. He forgives transgressions and sins for the sake of Jesus, who has become the propitiation for our sins. Through faith in Christ, the guilty transgressor is brought into favor with God and into the strong hope of life eternal. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1070. We must live by faith, for without faith it is impossible to please God. It is the privilege of every soul to exercise faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But pure spiritual life comes only as the soul surrenders itself to the will of God through Christ, the reconciling Savior. It is our privilege to be worked by the Holy Spirit. Through the exercise of faith, we are brought into communion with Christ Jesus, for Christ dwells in the hearts of all who are meek and lowly. Theirs is a faith that works by love and purifies the soul, a faith that brings peace to the heart and leads in the path of self-denial and self-sacrifice. This Day with God, page 359. Sunday, June 13. Reflections of Calvary. Christ's death proves God's great love for man. It is our pledge of salvation. To remove the cross from the Christian would be like blotting the sun from the sky. The cross brings us near to God, reconciling us to Him. With the relenting compassion of a father's love, Jehovah looks upon the suffering that His Son endured in order to save the race from eternal death and accepts us in the Beloved. Without the cross, man could have no union with the Father. On it depends our every hope. From it shines the light of the Savior's love, and when at the foot of the cross the sinner looks up to the one who died to save him, he may rejoice with fullness of joy, for his sins are pardoned. Kneeling in faith at the cross, he has reached the highest place to which man can attain. Through the cross we learn that the Heavenly Father loves us with a love that is infinite. Can we wonder that Paul exclaimed, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ? Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. 
It is our privilege also to glory in the cross, our privilege to give ourselves wholly to Him who gave Himself for us. Then, with the light that streams from Calvary shining in our faces, we may go forth to reveal this light to those in darkness. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 209 and 210. The Cross of Christ. How many believe it to be what it is? How many bring it into their studies and know its true significance? There could not be a Christian in our world without the cross of Christ. Let all, from the highest to the lowest, understand what it means to glory in the cross of Christ. That cross is to be bravely and manfully born. This is the highest science that we can learn, the science of salvation. The cross of Calvary, rightly regarded, is true philosophy, pure and undefiled religion. It is eternal life to all who believe. By painstaking effort, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, it should be impressed upon the minds that the cross of Christ is just as efficacious now as in Paul's day and should be as perfectly understood by them as it was by the great apostle. Sons and Daughters of God, page 231. Looking upon the crucified Redeemer, we more fully comprehend the magnitude and meaning of the sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven. The plan of salvation is glorified before us, and the thought of Calvary awakens living and sacred emotions in our hearts. Praise to God and the Lamb will be in our hearts and on our lips, for pride and self-worship cannot flourish in the soul that keeps fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. He who beholds the Savior's matchless love will be elevated in thought, purified in heart, transformed in character. He will go forth to be a light to the world, to reflect in some degree this mysterious love. The Desire of Ages, page 661. Monday, June 14. The Covenant and the Sacrifice. Wonderful, almost too wonderful for man to comprehend, is the Savior's sacrifice in our behalf, shadowed forth in all the sacrifices of the past, in all the services of the typical sanctuary. And this sacrifice was called for. When we realize that His suffering was necessary in order to secure our eternal well-being, our hearts are touched and melted. No one less holy than the only begotten of the Father could have offered a sacrifice that would be efficacious to cleanse all, even the most sinful and degraded, who accept the Savior as their atonement and become obedient to heaven's law. Nothing less could have reinstated man in God's favor. Our ransom has been paid by our Savior. No one need be enslaved by Satan. Christ stands before us as our all-powerful helper. In all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 309. In his hatred of God, in falsifying his character, in manifesting irreverence, contempt, and hatred toward the laws of his government, Satan had made iniquity reach unto the heavens, and it was his purpose to swell iniquity to such great proportions that it would make atonement seem impossible, so that the Son of God, who sought to save a lost world, should be crushed beneath the curse of sin. The working of the vigilant foe in presenting to Christ the vast proportions of transgression caused such poignant pain that he felt that he could not remain in the immediate presence of any human being. The sword of justice was unsheathed, and the wrath of God against iniquity rested upon man's substitute, Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ suffered in man's stead, 
and the human nature of the Son of God staggered under the terrible horror of the guilt of sin until from his pale and quivering lips was forced the agonizing cry, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But if there is no other way by which the salvation of fallen man may be accomplished, then not as I will, but as thou wilt. Human nature would then and there have died under the horror of the sense of sin, had not an angel from heaven strengthened him to bear the agony. The power that inflicted retributive justice upon man's substitute and surety was the power that sustained and upheld the suffering one under the tremendous weight of wrath that would have fallen upon a sinful world. Christ was suffering the death that was pronounced upon the transgressors of God's law. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, pages 1102 and 1103. Tuesday, June 15. The Faith of Abraham, Part 1. This same covenant given to Adam was renewed to Abraham in the promise, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. This promise pointed to Christ. So Abraham understood it. See Galatians chapter 3, verses 8 and 16. And he trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It was this faith that was accounted unto him for righteousness. The covenant with Abraham also maintained the authority of God's law. The testimony of God concerning his faithful servant was, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Genesis chapter 26, verse 5. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 370. By faith, faith that renounces all self-trust, the needy suppliant is to lay hold upon infinite power. No outward observances can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. It is not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. At every advanced step heavenward, it is to be renewed. All our good works are dependent on a power outside of ourselves. Therefore, there needs to be a continual reaching out of the heart after God, a continual, earnest, heartbreaking confession of sin and humbling of the soul before Him. Only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. Reflecting Christ, page 260. Righteousness is obedience to the law. The law demands righteousness, and this the sinner owes to the law. But he is incapable of rendering it. The only way in which he can attain to righteousness is through faith. By faith he can bring to God the merits of Christ, and the Lord places the obedience of his Son to the sinner's account. Christ's righteousness is accepted in place of man's failure, and God receives, pardons, justifies the repentant believing soul treats him as though he were righteous, and loves him as he loves his son. This is how faith is accounted righteousness, and the pardoned soul goes on from grace to grace, from light to a greater light. The touch of faith opens to us the divine treasure house of power and wisdom, and thus, through instruments of clay, God accomplishes the wonders of his grace. This living faith is our great need today. We must know that Jesus is indeed ours, that His Spirit is purifying and refining our hearts. If the followers of Christ had genuine faith, 
with meekness and love, what a work they might accomplish, what fruit would be seen to the glory of God. God's Amazing Grace, page 265. Wednesday, June 16. The Faith of Abraham, Part 2. We must learn in the school of Christ, nothing but His righteousness can entitle us to one of the blessings of the covenant of grace. We have long desired and tried to obtain these blessings, but have not received them because we have cherished the idea that we could do something to make ourselves worthy of them. We have not looked away from ourselves, believing that Jesus is a living Savior. We must not think that our own grace and merits will save us. The grace of Christ is our only hope of salvation. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 351. Works will not buy for us an entrance into heaven. The one great offering that has been made is ample for all who will believe. The love of Christ will animate the believer with new life. He who drinks from the water of the fountain of life will be filled with the new wine of the kingdom. Faith in Christ will be the means whereby the right spirit and motive will actuate the believer, and all goodness and heavenly mindedness will proceed from him who looks unto Jesus, the author and finisher of his faith. Look up to God, look not to men. God is your heavenly Father who is willing patiently to bear with your infirmities and to forgive and heal them. Christ the Center of the Message, The Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, March 20, 1894. Christ came from the courts of glory to this sin-polluted world and humbled himself to humanity. He identified himself with our weaknesses and was tempted in all points like as we are. Christ perfected a righteous character here upon the earth, not on his own account, for his character was pure and spotless, but for fallen man. His character he offers to man if he will accept it. The sinner through repentance of his sins, faith in Christ, and obedience to the perfect law of God has the righteousness of Christ imputed to him. It becomes his righteousness, and his name is recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. He becomes a child of God, a member of the royal family. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 371. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. If he can control minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. God's people must have faith which will lay hold of divine power. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Gospel Workers, page 161. Thursday, June 17. Resting on the Promises. There is an evidence that is open to all, the most highly educated and the most illiterate, the evidence of experience. God invites us to prove for ourselves the reality of His Word, the truth of His promises. He bids us taste and see that the Lord is good, Psalm 34, verse 8. Instead of depending upon the word of another, we are to taste for ourselves. He declares, ask and ye shall receive, John chapter 16, verse 24. His promises will be fulfilled. They have never failed. They never can fail. And as we draw near to Jesus and rejoice in the fullness of His love, our doubt and darkness will disappear in the light of His presence. Steps to Christ, page 111. Our Savior purchased the human race by humiliation of the very severest kind. 
he points us to the only path that will lead to the straight gate, opening into the narrow way, beyond which lie broad and pleasant pastures. He has marked out every step of the way, and that no one may make a mistake, he tells us just what to do. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew chapter 11, verses 29 and 30. This is the only way in which sinners can be saved. Knowing that no one can obey this command in his own strength, Christ tells us not to be worried nor afraid, but to remember what he can do if we come to him, trusting in his strength. He says, If you yoke up with me, your Redeemer, I will be your strength, your efficiency. The blessings connected with Christ's invitation can be realized and enjoyed by those only who wear Christ's yoke. Accepting this invitation, you withdraw your sympathy, your affections, from the world and place them where you can enjoy the blessing of close fellowship and communion with God. By coming to Christ, you bind up your interests with His. In Heavenly Places, page 53. If any man will come after me, Christ said, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. This is the proof of discipleship. If church members would be doers of the word, as they solemnly pledged themselves to be when they received baptism, they would love their brethren and would be constantly seeking for unity and harmony. Those who believe in Christ and walk humbly with Him, who watch to see what they can do to help and bless and strengthen the souls of others, cooperate with the angels who minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. Jesus gives them grace and wisdom and righteousness, making them a blessing to all with whom they are brought in contact. The more humble they are in their own estimation, the more blessings they receive from God, because receiving does not exalt them. They make a right use of their blessings, for they receive to impart. This Day with God, page 356. For further reading, Gospel Workers, The Way to Christ, pages 158 to 160. And Our High Calling, Wearing Christ's Yoke, page 100.